praise to the Lord who does prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can to the Lord, oh let all that is in me adore Him. All that has life and breath, come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for Why should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can be by any means redeemed, can redeem his brother, nor give God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless perish, person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by, but life eternal calls to us at the cross. I 
rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Two wonders here that I confess. My worth and my unworthiness My value fixed, my ransom paid At the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure Wellspring of my soul trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him alone i rejoice in my redeemer greatest treasure wellspring of my soul i will trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in Good morning. It's good to see you all here. As Doug said, uh, my name is Rick Ellis, and I serve here as one of the elders at Grace Community Church. And I'd like to add my welcome, and especially for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, we, we do give uh, Ross a bit of a break during the summer, and so uh, I'm here to preach a message this week, and I, d I trust you'll be blessed by it. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning needing your mercy, needing your patience, and needing your grace. As we approach your word, I, I pray that you would quiet our hearts and let your truths overwhelm us. I pray that each person here today would be impacted for having encountered you through your preached word. Give us ears to hear the message that you have for us today. Help us not to think about how it might apply to others, but how it applies to me. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Lord, I pray that you would use your servant to change hearts. Let your word shine forth for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to uh, ask you who came after Jacob in the line of the Jewish patriarchs, who would you say? After Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who's next? You might say Joseph. You might say Reuben. What about Judah? I had an opportunity to take an expository preaching seminar this past fall, just prior to the G3 conference in Atlanta. That seminar was taught by several very strong and experienced pastors, and it reinforced many of the th same things we hold true here at GCC the sufficiency and inerrancy of scripture, the importance of verse-by-verse -verse exposition of a text, and that all scripture is meant to point us to Christ. It was aimed at lay leaders as well as young pastors and sought to give us tools and a framework to ensure that we're preaching God's purpose in meeting for a passage and not twisting scripture to fit a point that we'd like to make. That's why we here at GCC generally preach and teach verse by verse through various books of the Old and New Testaments. The text I'm going to focus on here today is from uh, Genesis 44, but you'll see that it relates pretty closely to what Ross has been preaching in the book of James. It's going to take a little while to get to, the, to, to Genesis 44, as I have some background to share, but I trust that you'll appreciate it once we, once we get there. For now, if you'd open in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 38, we'll be coming to that shortly. 
We commonly think of the last 14 chapters of Genesis to be about Joseph. He is at the forefront of most of these chapters, and there are easily dozens of sermons that can be drawn from his life. I hope to show you here this morning that there's an equally important storyline of redemption and repentance underlying that narrative. I'm going to give you an overview of the chapters and encourage you to do some additional study for yourselves. There's a possibility, Lord willing, that we'll take this study one step further this, uh, sometime this fall in one of our Sunday morning adult studies. I do encourage everyone here to be involved in one of those Sunday morning studies. Right now, uh, Doug is leading a group, group through a book of Ephesians, and I'm working with a different group through the book of Galatians. They're an excellent place for fellowship, for learning, and I think you'll appreciate the time that you spend there. Last week, I recommended a book for the congregation called Joseph and the Gospel of Many Colors. That book actually deals with many of the same portions of scripture I'm going to talk about this morning. Its author, Bodhi Bakum, was one of the instructors in the seminar that I attended. He helped us to see that the story of Judah's repentance is woven into Joseph's story and is in some ways more significant than some of the aspects of Joseph's story. We're all familiar with the book of Genesis. It's the first book of the Bible. It's a book of beginnings. Genesis gives us a story of creation, the fall, where Adam and Eve's sin brought all of humanity under the curse of sin, the rampant wickedness which God punished in a worldwide flood, and then the start of a people who would be God's chosen people for redemption. There are three themes that are seen again and again through Genesis, the land, the seed, and the promise. This is probably worth some study on your own, but briefly, the land can be seen in creation, where it was created. The land is also seen in the flood, where it was destroyed and reformed due to man's wickedness. The land is in Ab the Abrahamic covenant, where God promised that his people would have a promised land, a land, a land and the land is also in Jacob's flight to Egypt, where the chosen people were taken out of the promised land to prepare them for God's work. The seed also shows up again and again. In creation, seeds are explicit. Genesis 1.11, God said, let, there, let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. After the fall, God made a promise that the offspring or seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. This, of course, is a promise that God fulfilled by sending his son Jesus to earth, where he achieved victory over sin and death. We then see seeds mentioned after the flood, as the world was repopulated. And finally, seed, or offspring, depending on your translation, is seen in God's promise to Abraham that his seed would be greater in number than the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. Included also in that promise to Abraham, to Abraham's seed, was a blessing for all the earth, pointing once again forward to Christ. And the promise. The promise that the offspring of a woman would bruise the head of the serpent and bring redemption for man. The promise that Abraham's seed would be a blessing for all the earth. There's also a promise that God would never again send a worldwide flood. A promise made to Hagar that Ishmael would become a large nation. You can see that the land, the seed, and the promise are critical themes in Genesis. Reread the book sometime with those themes in mind. Look for how those ideas of land, seed, and promise are underlying the entire book. We know that the entire Bible is God's story, and it's clear here from the beginning that he had a plan for redeeming and restoring mankind and creation. I want to spend some time now looking at Genesis chapters 37 through the end of the book. As I said before, this covers a lot of ground. There's no way to do it justice in just one sermon. But what I want to show you is that these chapters are not solely about Joseph. They also present to us a wonderful picture of redemption in the life of Judah. The overall flow of these chapters is to connect the land, the seed, and the promise to Judah, who in the end is next in line to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me stop and let that think in. Judah is the next after the patri patriarchs. In the last 14 chapters of Genesis, there is as much about Judah 
in his, re- in his redemption, his, in his life, as there is about Joseph. We're familiar with the Jewish patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis 12 through 37 follows the Hebrews of men in their lives. And then from Jacob's 12 sons, it's Judah, not Simeon, the oldest, not Joseph, the favorite and most successful, who emerges as the seed through whom God would fulfill his promises. The narrative of Joseph's life is instructive, but there are important and critical narratives about God's grace in the life of Judah as well that we shouldn't miss. God's grace in the life of Judah points us to Christ. One of the things that was reinforced in the preaching class I mentioned was the need to be diligent and thoughtful when we read and study the Bible. It's easy and natural to read it superficially and find some surface truths that we think might apply to our lives without fully grasping the big picture and the overarching message of the text. There are many examples of churches, pastors, and books that focus more on good morals and good works rather than God's blessings, or or in God's blessings, rather than on sin, repentance, and salvation. In his book, Soul Searching, Christian Smith refers to this worldview as moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Vody Bauckham summarized this worldview as having five tenets. First, there is a God who created the world. Second, God wants us to be good. Third, the main goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. Fourth, God does not need to be particularly involved in our lives unless we need him. And fifth, good people go to heaven when they die. Let me read through those again. There is a God who created the world. God wants us to be good. The main goal of life is to be happy and feel good about myself. God doesn't need to be particularly involved in my life unless I need something. And good people go to heaven when they die. You probably all know people who have this worldview, right? I hope we all recognize the issues with this worldview. But if we're honest, we can sometimes fall into it ourselves. Let's face it, we have a desire to be happy and feel good about ourselves, and so we kind of expect God to want the same. We do sometimes leave God on the outside when things are going well. We'll call on him when we need him. It's easy for us to call out this worldview as false. But sometimes we become practical, moralistic, therapeutic deists when we focus inwardly on ourselves and not on the work of Christ. So in this worldview, the Bible then becomes a source of where we can draw out some moralistic message, maybe worthy of Aesop's fables. We add a dose of blessing that we receive from God's providence and preach it under the banner of God. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. You can find it all over the Christian bookstores. You can find it in too many churches that lead with that kind of message. But it's not the message of the Bible. Scripture's not about morals and rules. It's not about our happiness or fulfillment. It's not about being good. It's about redemption through God's grace. The story of Joseph offers some tremendous lessons in God's sovereignty, God's timing, God's provision in times of trouble, and what's probably the best text in Scripture for the meaning of true forgiveness. And we'll touch on some of those. But it also is key, has a key place in the story of redemption. Joseph's is a compelling story, one apparently worthy of Broadway and Hollywood. It has villains, intrigue, suspense, and if you don't continue into the book of Exodus, a happy ending when the family is reunited and thrives in Egypt. Ross talked last week when he was preaching on James about how clearly Joseph understood God's sovereignty and what an example he was of giving God glory in his life. So don't misunderstand me. These are all good areas for us to study and teach. We should talk about Jacob and his shortcomings as a father. We should talk about God's sovereignty in putting Joseph in Egypt and giving him the ability to interpret dreams. We should teach on the importance of forgiveness, no matter what wrong has been done against us. But we also need to draw out and show the life of Judah, his sin, his rebellion, his self-centered life, and ultimately his repentance and the blessing that followed when he was chosen by God 
to be the next in line for the seed that would redeem God's creation. So let me quickly, quickly give you some of the history about Jacob's family. Of course, Jacob was second born to Isaac, the brother of Esau. He coerced Esau into giving up his birthright and with the help of his mother, Rebekah, tricked Isaac into giving him the blessing. He then had to flee his brother and married two daughters of Laban who competed for his love and attention. Eventually, those daughters, directly or indirectly through their nursemaids, gave him 12 sons. Jacob played favorite among, among the sons and preferred the sons of Rachel. In truth, the oldest son, Reuben, should have been, <clears throat> should have been the head of the family. He was the oldest. But he had committed adultery with one of his father's concubines, and that disqualified him. Simeon and Levi would have been next in line, but... They had gone on a murderous rampage to avenge their sister, and the blood on their hands also disqualified them. In truth, Judah, the next in line, was no better than his brothers. Please stand while I read Genesis 38. And I'm going to read the whole chapter, so hopefully you can get comfortable. <laughs> it happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son. And he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kezib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that his offspring would not be his, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira the Dolomite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Anayim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, taking off her veil. She put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adolamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at Anayim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute had been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent a young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by, immoral by the immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not know her again. When the time came for her labor, there were twins in her, in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on its hand. 
saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, the brother came out, and she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Please be seated. So in the previous chapter to this, chapter 37, we saw the details of Joseph's favored position in the family, his unpopular dreams, and the plot of ten brothers first to kill him, and then at Judah's suggestion to sell him into slavery. I think some might suggest that Judah's convincing his brothers to sell Joseph uh, rather than kill him was some sort of act of kindness, but most commentators would agree that Slavery in ancient Egypt was in fact no better than death. And that Judah really probably acted out of greed rather than compassion. Then here in chapter 38, right in the middle of Joseph's story, we see Judah piling sin upon sin. It should have been clear to Judah that marrying a Canaanite was forbidden. I'm sure he would have heard the stories of Jacob going back to Isaac's family and the family homeland in order to take a wife from the clan rather than a Canaanite. At the very least, he should have known that association with the locals was a bad idea. But Judah, who was probably between 16 and 20 years old at the time, as it happened, met an Adulamite named Hira. From the text, we can see that Hira became a long, long-term friend. He was there when Judah met Shua. He was there more than 20 years later when Judah had been widowed. We don't know much about Hira, but we can deduce from the text that he wasn't a very good influence on Judah. So there's at least a 20-year period here where three sons are born and grow up to the point where two of them have taken wives. We don't know much about this time except that Joseph is languishing in Egypt and Judah's sons are wicked to the point where Ur is put to death by God. Even though leveret marriage hadn't been given yet, that, that practice of a son having a child to further his deceased brother's name, that wasn't given by God until after the exodus, But Judah did instruct Onan to raise a son for Ur. Again, there's a lot that could be said here, and it's a strange practice for us, but it wasn't unusual in those days. Remember, one of the themes of the book of Genesis is the seed and the need for the family to continue. I know that the ladies will have a chance to dig into this further when they study Ruth this September, since Ruth was also given to Boaz in an act of leveret marriage. So as we read, Onan refused to provide an heir, And he also was struck dead. If we fast forward a few years now, Shelah has come of age, but Judah does not send him to Tamar. This was a big deal. Tamar had no hope of marriage or care as a childless widow. She was depending on Judah to fulfill his promise, but he didn't. A widow in those times had no hope, no future, no one to depend on, no provision, no protection. So Tamar took matters into her own hands. Here again, we see sin upon sin as both Tamar and Judah are breaking God's law. But at the same time, we see God's sovereignty at work. Despite their sin, Judah and Tamar are to be in the lineage of Jesus. They bear a son who maintains the promise that God made. The Gospel of Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus, the lineage of the Messiah, from Abraham right up to the Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. And right toward the front of the line in verse 3 is Judah, the father of Perez by Tamar. We might ask, why does God use sinful people? Of course, the answer is that's all there is. He has nothing else to work with. All people are sinful. But I think we also need to wonder why these sinful people. In the case of Tamar, she wasn't even Jewish. In the case of Judah, he had selfishly abandoned his family. Shouldn't God use the best and brightest among us? Wouldn't it have made more sense for God to use Joseph, who had persevered in trials, led a nation, and given glory to God? Or maybe Benjamin, who had not been implicated in selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites? Or maybe Reuben as the oldest and logical heir? The the short answer is that God chooses. He chooses both who and how his will will be accomplished. The God who created everything and upholds it by his right hand. The God who sustains and protects us in all things. 
The God who is holy and just and omniscient chooses. And we should trust that he chooses perfectly. He doesn't make mistakes. He's not taken by surprise. He already knows the end from the beginning. And so we really need to trust in his choices. Psalm 78 recounts the exodus from Egypt and how the Lord guided and protected and sustained the Jews through 40 years of wandering, eventually in their entry into their promised land. Asaph wrote the psalm, and in verse 5 it says, He commanded our fathers to teach their children. The next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they all set their hope in God, and not to forget the works of God, but to keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful. Then after quite a bit of recounting the history of the Exodus, in verse 67, Asaph wrote, He rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. Nothing more than that. He rejected Joseph's line and chose Judah, period. Doesn't make sense to us. and For us, it's not natural for God not to choose the obvious one. Every, everything in us wants us to think that Joseph should be the one. The prophet Isaiah is also helpful here in chapter 55, verse 8. Isaiah shows us some part of the reason why we can't comprehend how God chooses as he does. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as, hard, as far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God did cut out Ur and Onan for their wickedness. Why not Judah and Tamar as well? Because he chose. Because of his mercy. Judah and Tamar did not deserve blessing, but God did bless them. You and I did not deserve blessing, but assuming that he's done a work in your heart to save you, he has shown mercy. Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5, we learn a little bit more about God's choice in the life of believers. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So God, in his infinite wisdom, chooses who he will bless, and he is perfect and merciful in doing so. Ross preached on the sovereignty of God just last week, that God is in control of all things and that he works all things for his glory and for our good. He often does things that not the way that we expect or the way that we like even or what seems most sensible to us, but he is perfect and never wrong. And so we need to accept in glory in what God's doing. Truth is, it should drive us to our knees in thanks to him who saved us. We who God has chosen should be the th most thankful, humble, and contrite people Truth is, God didn't need to choose anyone, but he did. So back to Genesis. Chapter 39 now takes us to, to Joseph's story in Egypt and the roller coaster life that he had. Again, there are great demonstrations here of God's sovereignty, kindness, and provision, and they're all worthy of our study. There's a great famine in the land, and Egypt thrives because of Joseph's God-directed plans while Jacob and his family fall on hard times. As we follow Judah through this narrative, we have to jump over to chapter 42, verse 10, where the brothers come in search of food. This is the first appearance of the brothers before Joseph. And none of the brothers is willing to sacrifice at all for the others, and they spend most of their time fretting about what's going to happen. They're all looking to save their own skin. Joseph, who was probably wondering why Benjamin did not come, takes Simeon as a hostage and sends the rest away with food. But he tells them to come back with Benjamin to prove that they're not spies. It's interesting as we see the end of chapter 42 into chapter 43 that the family doesn't immediately do that. They don't do what Joseph asked. They, they, don't, they don't bring Benjamin back to have Simeon freed. And in fact, they wait until the food's all gone again. They were content to have lost Simeon as well as Joseph to protect themselves. There's no talk of trying a rescue or no options put forth. 
I wonder if the famine had ended so that Jacob's family could have fed themselves if they ever would have gone back to rescue Simeon or just forgotten about him like they forgot about Joseph. But the brothers finally do go back, and this time they take Benjamin. Joseph is watching carefully for any change in heart in his brothers. Another test where Joseph planted a silver goblet in Benjamin's sack gives him his answer. Judah, who was probably almost 50 years old by this time, not a boy, he was a man with children and flocks and responsibility, probably had the lifetime of of sin weighing on him, he finally stepped forward in chapter 44, verse 16. And Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are the Lord's servants, both we and he in whom the cup has been found. And then jumping down to verse 33, Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. This is quite a change for Judah. It's a picture of true repentance. It's a 180 degree change in attitude and behavior. I want to spend a few minutes here talking about two aspects of this repentance in Judah. The first is that Judah was broken when he recognized that his sin was against God. And secondly, that the humility that came from that brokenness, from that realization. Again, Ross preached from James just last week about, uh, in, I'm sorry, two weeks ago in James chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. And those ideas of brokenness and repentance are front and center in that passage as well. So in chapter 44, verse 16, Joseph admitted to Joseph, who he only knew as a powerful pagan, that God had found out his sin and the sin of his brothers. There's no doubt he would have been thinking about the sin that they'd committed against Joseph and Jacob, likely thinking about his sin in marrying a Canaanite, raising two wicked sons, maybe the sin he'd committed against Tamar in abandoning her. He probably was thinking about those people, but he was also seeing that his sin was against the holy God, the God who had created him, the God who is perfect and righteous. Remember what Judah said after Tamar revealed the father of her child? Surely she is more righteous than me. Judah had, had his eyes open to the fact that his sin, while it did hurt other people in some pretty significant ways, more importantly, it had event, offended and separated him from God. True repentance could only happen when we understand that our sin is against the holy God. That's my primary point here this morning. Feeling badly about how things have turned out is not repentance. Feeling ashamed for my behavior and how it's landed me in trouble is not repentance. Being sorry I got caught is not repentance. Any pang of conscience that I feel is not repentance. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. The truth is, for most of us, we probably don't feel badly enough. We aren't ashamed enough of our sin. We're not sorry enough given that our sin is before a holy God. It's natural to feel bad about the consequences of our sin, but being sorry for the consequences is worldly sorrow. And worldly sorrow does not lead to salvation. It leads to death. As Paul wrote, godly sorrow leads to repentance and leaves no regret. Salvation makes us right with God and no longer afraid for our future. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are assured of a hope and a future. So our sin does have consequences. When we sin, we hurt others. Judah's sin had landed Joseph in an Egyptian jail. It had separated him from his family and caused him to be in a very awkward relationship with his daughter-in-law. Sin ruins relationships. It wrecks finances. It creates hardships. But those are all worldly results. None of those comes close to the significance of the fact that we sin against God. The good news is that God uses those hardships. He uses those circumstances to break us and to lead us to repentance. The problem is we don't like the process. We don't like to be reminded of our sin, and we don't like living with the results of our sin. 
So we look for an easy way out. We have no room for discomfort these days. We have no tolerance for feeling badly. The world has a thousand enemies for anything that puts us out of sorts. Take this drug, try this program, read this book, see this therapist. It's all, re- all aimed at removing discomfort, all designed to make us feel better. There's little room for shame in our world today. But rather than being shamed at our behavior, we often try and explain it away or make it be okay. Christians do this too. Pray this prayer. Do this good work. Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, all meant to give us a quick and painless path away from discomfort, but they fall short of true repentance. Jay Adams, in his book, uh, Competence to Counsel, wrote that it's like the engine light is on in the car and we've learned to break the light. We know there's a problem, but we don't fix it or even acknowledge it. We break the light. We should be crushed under the weight of our sin, not looking for a way to get out. We need to recognize that it's not about me. It's not about my comfort. It's about God and giving him the glory that comes from true repentance. We turn very quickly to the moralistic therapeutic deism I mentioned earlier. We look for ways to make ourselves feel better. We look for ways to take away the pain. But the world's solutions are temporary and ineffective. David provided a wonderful picture of brokenness leading to repentance in Psalm 51. This is a familiar psalm, so I won't spend a lot of time on the background, but let me remind you that David wrote this psalm about a year after he had sinned in taking Bathsheba and having Uriah killed. The baby that Bathsheba was carrying had died, and Joseph is lamenting his sin in the whole matter. Notice here that David recognizes that his sin is against God and God alone. Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David knows that he sinned against the holy God and that God is justified in any punishment that he determines. God is blameless in judging the wicked because he alone is holy and perfect. David also shows this brokenness, shows that he is broken and crushed by what he's done in verse 8. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. David doesn't ask God not to break the bones or even to mend the bones. He asks God to make the broken bones rejoice. In other words, God, please use this brokenness that you have caused in me to bring joy. Let this brokenness lead to repentance and life. And finally, in verse 17 The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Elsewhere, Scripture tells us that God does not want our sacrifices of stuff, bulls, goats, or wine. He wants our hearts. He wants our worship. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. I mentioned Ross's preaching on James 4, 8, and 9 earlier. James wrote, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You see it all there as well. We are to weep and mourn over our sin. We are to humble ourselves before the Lord, then he will exalt us. We don't exalt ourselves. This is an ongoing process. It's not once and done. Years after saving us, we should still look back and lament our sin before him. Think about it. Our senses bring back memories. A certain smell or sight will bring things to mind. Certain places or events will cause us to remember the same events or places from the past. We also remember our sin. We remember the person that we used to be. We remember the person, we should remember that person and weep over our sin. While God has covered those sins and forgiven us, there's still scar tissue. There's still consequences and damage left behind. There's still a reminder of our sin and rebellion. If you're a believer, do you look back and weep over your sin? Do you look back and praise God for what he's done to remove you from that? We should. When we sin, we sin against the God who created the universe, the God who will come and judge the world. 
the God who could have and maybe should have killed me in my sleep last night for what I thought and spoke only yesterday, but who instead made the ultimate sacrifice for me. So scripture doesn't give us a lot of detail, but it's reasonable to think that Judah may have had thoughts over the years about how he had wronged Joseph. He may have lamented his friendship with Hiram that drew him away from his family. He may have felt a pang of remorse when he thought about Tamar in her father's house with no chance of a future. He may have felt badly for his father and probably countless other situations where he had come up short in his life. But it's not until this point where he comes to realize that his sin is against God and that God knows all that he can truly repent. So the first point that I want us to remember here today is that repentance comes out of brokenness. If we think of repentance as changing direction in the highway of life, then brokenness is the off-ramp that allows us to go the other way. Brokenness is the first step in turning our lives around and heading in a new and God-glorifying way. There are no shortcuts. There's no easier method. We need to be crushed by our sin. We need to weep and mourn that we've offended God. And remember, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride is the thing that gets in the way of being truly broken before God. If there are people in your life who you see struggling, people who are experiencing earthly sorrow for whatever reason, recognize it could well be God working in their lives to break them. It could be that the Lord is breaking down their pride. In those situations, please don't try and give them an easy answer or make things easier. Don't give them a shortcut to feeling better. Turn them to the Lord who can truly heal them. Point them to eternal peace rather than temporary relief from their pain. Speak the truth of the gospel to them. My second point is that true repentance leads to humility. Reaching that point of brokenness where we know without a doubt that our sin is against the holy God and that we have no hope in ourselves will naturally lead to humility. Seeing what God has done for us while we were yet undeserving but host- and hostile towards him should enable us to think less of ourselves. It's really a cyclical thing. Brokenness fuels humility, and humility is the foundation of brokenness. Let me say that again. Brokenness fuels humility, and humility is the foundation for brokenness. If we don't see our sin as being against God, we can sometimes try and justify or rationalize it. We can try and explain it away. We do this often by shifting the blame. You know, you might hear yourself say, well, what has she done for me? He didn't deserve for me to help him. Well, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I've tried to make her happy, but she doesn't appreciate it. All those are ways of shifting the blame, rationalizing our sin and putting it on someone else. If you think in any way that your sin is someone else's fault, you've not been broken. You're not humble. In the garden, Adam said to God, this woman that you gave me caused me to sin, as he tried to deflect and shift the blame for his sin. And we still do this today. We grumble about our jobs. We allow a root of bitterness against family members. We complain about the direction of the country, and we sin in our impatience or frustration. In those cases, we really are taking a page out of Adam's book. If I blame my job for my impatience, I'm really saying, Lord, it's not my fault. This job that you gave me is causing me to sin. Or if I fail to cherish my wife because of something in her that bothers me, I'm I'm blaming God. It wasn't me, this woman that you gave me. You see how it works? But if I'm humble, if I understand, as Ross preached last week, that God is sovereign and works all things for his glory and my good, I can't help but own my sin, repent, and draw closer to God. When you're confronted by sin, do you look for other people or circumstances to blame? Does pride keep you from accepting responsibility for your actions? You get angry and escalate the issue to try and prove yourself better? All these reflect a lack of humility. As long as we can compare ourselves to others, as long as we can measure our behavior by our own rules, we'll come out on top. Let's be honest. If I set the rules and I determine success, then I better, well, be successful. We need to push aside all the fleshly and worldly measures that we know. We need to stifle our own defense mechanisms and consider our lives against God's perfect and holy standard. So humility is the act of setting aside what I think I need and putting someone else's needs or desires ahead of my own. 
You see it here in Judah's insistence that he be taken prisoner instead of Benjamin. Judah is putting both Jacob and Benjamin's needs first. Judah, who had previously suggested selling Joseph, who had rebelled against his father by going to start a family in Canaan, who had turned his back on his daughter-in-law and left her destitute, who didn't lift a hand when Simeon was first imprisoned, this Judah is now insisting that Joseph take him and put him in prison for something he didn't do. We're all selfish by nature. We want what we want, and we have trouble putting anyone else's needs before us. On top of that, our culture and society teach us that it's all about me. I deserve to win. I need to watch out for number one. Life's a competition, and I can't show weakness. You fill in the blanks. Every bit of our flesh pulls us towards competition and self-preservation. We are so steeped in this that we actually get angry when things don't go our way. It's pretty clear to me that old Judah would have had no problem packing up and going home. He might have made up a story for Jacob or maybe blamed Benjamin for stealing the cup. But he didn't go. He offered himself as a substitute for the sake of his brother and father. He laid down his life, his freedom, and his desires for others. This is true humility, and it's born out of brokenness. We need to clearly see how bad we are. I need to remember how bad I was in order to fully appreciate how great, gracious God is in saving me. So let me ask, do you have a problem with humility? Do you have a problem putting others, especially those that God has put in your life, like spouse, children, parents, or church friends, before yourself? Do you get angry at others who are not living up to your expectations? If you can't honestly say that you demonstrate humility in these relationships, I strongly encourage you to look back. Remember who you were. Remember your sin and the punishment that you deserved. Acting out humility will be costly. It'll be tiring, but it's possible. Do you weep over your sin? Can you see where God crushed you and brought you to repentance? Are you able to see God's grace changing you? If you can't answer yes, and if you struggle with humility, I implore you to fall on your knees, get down on your face before the Lord, and ask for his mercy. Call on the power of the Spirit to work in you and give you strength. At a church this size, it's reasonable to believe that there might be some here who have been deceived. May well be some here who took what appeared to be the easy path and never truly repented of their sins, never saw their sin as the rebellion it is against the holy God, never been broken before the Lord. Scripture is clear, if you haven't been born again, if you haven't been made right with God, then there will be a change of, if you have been made right with God, there will be a change of heart, there'll be a change of attitude, there'll be a change of behavior, and you'll have peace in situations that used to drive you crazy. It's a natural outcome of brokenness and repentance. It's not something you need to do, it's something that will be because of who you've become. It may not happen immediately. Sanctification is a process where the Spirit works out our hearts to conform us to Christ. But you should be able to see that process at work. You should be able to see situations where the Lord is changing you. If you don't see those things, I, again, implore you to fall on your knees, get down on your face before the Lord, and pray for, for his salvation. Pray that he would work in your heart even today. So humility doesn't come naturally. There's no seven-step plan to achieve it. It's a gift of the Spirit when we're saved. Humble yourself before the Lord today while you can, because you will humble yourself before him one day, and it's best if you do that now in repentance and not in judgment. So Joseph is certainly a hero in these chapters of Genesis. He withstood years of persecution and hardship and stayed faithful to the Lord through it all. He forgave his brothers and reunited his family in a place where they could thrive and grow. We're right to look at Joseph as a model of holiness. Right up until the end, his life was confident in the fact that it was God who was at work and would bring him out of the promised land. He even made his brothers promise that they would bring his bones out when they left. So Joseph is at the center of this story, but Judah is the seed. As Jacob said before he died, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from the, between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Jacob recognized that Judah was the seed that would carry the promise forward to the next generation. 
there's a lot of other points here that I wish I could have had time to, to develop further, but I want you to remember that the, the whole Bible is God's story of redemption. It's the history of God's work and the lives of sinful men and women for his glory. I trust that drawing out this particular story of Judah's repentance is an encouragement to you. Judah was willing to offer himself as a substitute for Benjamin, which points us to the greater lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, who offered himself as the sacrifice for sinners of all times. Christ is the hero of this story. Christ is the ultimate promised seed who leads us to a land of the new Jerusalem. We need to be struck by God's goodness and Christ's sacrifice in this story of redemption. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you again for your word, which we know is true. We thank you that it gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And as we read it, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to its truth. I pray that you would cause us to be a people who <clears throat> seek you in all that we do, Lord. And I pray that if there are any here who have not been broken, not repented of their sin, Lord, that you would be at work in their hearts and lives, that you would cause them to be on their knees before you and I pray that each of us would then, as you call for in your word, love one another with a love that only you can bring. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever amen, amen. you are amen. dismissed thank you, thank you.